My name is Terry Shillington. I'm honored to be your moderator, and I'm especially pleased to moderate Trevor Harrison's session. He's one of the real friends of SACPA in this city, and we welcome him back again. He's, he thinks he's spoken here about 200 times, um, more or less. Anyway, we welcome him, and I'm going to say no more. He, he needs no introduction, and uh, we're going to reflect about the Notley years and where we're going from here. And welcome, Trevor. Uh, thank you so much, Terry, and uh, thank you to uh, SACPA for inviting me here. Uh, this is a, uh, besides the usual pleasure of actually being here, this is a particular pleasure because uh, if I don't get uh, invited to these kind of live events, I tend to do things over Zoom and I just sit around in my pajama pants and a t-shirt. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of nice, gives me occasion to dress up again, you know, wear these clothes. So, very nice to be here. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Rachel Notley and I think her, her legacy and, and I was, as I was just saying to a local press here, I think that uh, uh, future historians will look back on uh, Notley and her years in government and service generally to uh, the province uh, fairly positively. Uh, critics aside, and there's always critics, but I think a, a fair estimation of her record uh, will stand up uh, reasonably well. Uh, and then after uh, uh, speaking about uh, Notley and her legacy, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where the NDP stands in the post-Notley era and a little bit about the uh, the candidates. I won't spend a lot of time with that, but a little bit, and about some of the challenges that the NDP will face going forwards. So, uh, with no more ado, let's go here. So, uh, what can I say here? So, there's a number of, I could pick out a number of things that uh, the Notley government did, uh, but uh, these are kind of the, a few of the highlights. I think certainly the daycare agreement, coming to an agreement with the federal government, and it continues uh, even with the, uh, the present government trying to uh, work out the ins and outs of that, and there's some controversy about that for sure. But I think that's, that's uh, a signature piece. Uh, the minimum wage uh, raise, uh, which again continues to be actually an issue. In fact, it's been raised by one of the uh, potential candidates for the uh, leadership. Uh, but I think this was an important issue, uh, and especially in the province as the, uh, the gap between the very wealthy and the not so wealthy uh, has increased. And as we know, just the cost of living generally. Uh, in this province and elsewhere. So I think the issue of the minimum wage uh, and the raise that they did at that time was an important one. Uh, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, rights, I think that uh, the Notley government properly uh, stood uh, four square in terms of supporting human rights uh, and particularly in this field. The uh, ending of coal, the use of coal, uh, it was actually scheduled to be uh, phased out in 2030, uh, but it was really under the Notley government that they moved ahead to end it as of 2023. The carbon tax, when we get to things that uh, remain very uh, controversial, uh, but I think that the, the Notley government's uh, actions in uh, bringing in a carbon tax, which eventually, of course, became a federal carbon tax until the Liberals decide to sabotage their own policy, <laughs> um, was actually a really good policy. Uh, the, uh, there's uh, probably every economist, right, left, center, wherever you want to find them, has basically said that the idea of a carbon tax is a really good idea. Uh, the fact that politicians then interfere and mess with it uh, is, is a separate kind of issue, but in terms of basically trying to get people to move them in two ways, carrots and sticks, trying to move people towards what needs to be done to save the planet, it's actually a really defensible policy. And unfortunately, it hasn't been explained very well, and again, politicians have kind of interfered with it, 
which is quite often the case, and labor law reforms. Uh, the uh, the laws, the regulations that the NDP brought in under uh, the Notley government were lambasted, of course, by uh, the opposition, by some in the business community, not all, but some. Uh, but in fact, all of those labor reforms were not terribly unusual or peculiar in any sense. In many cases, they simply replicated what is pretty standard labor law in every other province across the country. The fact that we have lagged in terms of uh, labor regulations and rights for workers uh, is nothing to be proud of. Uh, and so the NDP uh, properly again, I think, uh, tried to bring in uh, reforms that were meaningful. Many of those have been again drawn back again. This is one of the most, certainly the most anti-labor province in the country and has been for a long time. And when you hear things, uh, ideas being floated around about making right to work uh, a reality here in this province, we should all be very concerned. Do a quick check on Google, if you like, and look up the some 25 states in the United States that have right to work laws. Those are the poorest, least educated, uh, lowest wage regimes in all of the United States. And so there's a really direct correlation between right to work laws and uh, increased poverty for the general population. So again, these are really important things I think the NDP brought in. Whether or not they had lasting power, because again, many of them have been uh, drawn back by the current government, is irrespective of the fact that fundamentally these were decent and good policies. Some significant events during the Notley years, the oil price decline, and as I was saying to the media just prior to this, uh, sometimes uh, the, the worst thing that can happen to any uh, govern, government, any party being elected is being elected at the wrong time. Uh, and the fact that the uh, price of oil dropped through the bottom and we've seen this before in this province, but any government that uh, is in office at a time the oil declines is usually in trouble and the NDP never quite got over that problem. Uh, many of the, the issues around uh, the debt that the uh, province incurred during that time, again, entirely defensible policies. Uh, to have not spent during that period of time would have been, frankly, a really bad policy, somewhat akin, uh, akin to what we saw in the early 1930s when governments didn't want to spend during the Great Depression. Um, so it was defensible, but the NDP got uh, savage for it. And of course, the Fort McMurray fire, which if uh, uh, predictions hold true, that's going to look like a little blip in time as we go uh, forwards into the future uh, as things heat up. So what is the biggest legacy, it seems to me, though, irrespective of the particulars of the uh, uh, policies? I think the biggest legacy for the Notley years is that she was able to move it from being a party on the left, but sort of way out there and that no one really took terribly seriously. Uh, that they would ever govern, and suddenly, lo and behold, becoming government and being uh, legitimized as a, um, as a party, a challenger, a, a legitimate challenger to actually once again govern. So moving it from the fringe to the, uh, the center of politics in this province, it seems to me, is an important legacy. <clears throat> A couple of things here. What would be a talk without a few wonderful little graphs? Uh, if you just quickly look here, uh, this is the, um, the number of seats and the percentage of vote. And you'll see during the Notley years, it just wipes out every other previous uh, NDP effort in the province. So the uh, percentage of vote, uh, of course, last time around over 40%, uh, pretty close to 44%. It's really quite impressive for a party that uh, before used to, you know, come in at say 10, 12%. And of course, <clears throat> the number of seats as well. 
the peculiarities of our electoral system, to some extent, don't uh, don't show exactly what's going on for any party. Uh, but it is obvious from this graph that uh, the NDP under Notley did extremely well. <coughs> Uh, where the seats were won and lost. Uh, this ties into something I'll say about what the party needs to do going forwards here. But you'll notice that uh, in Edmonton, the uh, percentage of votes for the NDP, almost 63%, and they get uh, 20 seats. In fact, the UCP got no seats in Edmonton proper, uh, although they got some just on the, uh, the outskirts. Um, and even in Calgary, uh, the NDP got 49.3%, uh, which translated into 14 seats. Um, but in the rest of the province, uh, and I hesitate sometimes talking about just the rest of the province because this is an increasingly complex province where we have a lot of mid-sized cities, like here in Lethbridge, but also Red Deer, Grand Prairie, Medicine Hat, and others, that uh, the politics in those mid-sized cities isn't exactly the same as rural Alberta, which is the way traditionally we've thought of it. But the fact is, outside of uh, Edmonton and Calgary, only 32.3% of the vote, and uh, hence four seats. And you'll see then that the uh, UCP seats, as the the competitor, the government, uh, really mopped up very well in the areas outside of Edmonton and Calgary, taking 63% uh, of the vote and 37 of the seats. So without that, uh, the NDP would in fact be in government once more. So a couple of very interesting graphs here, and uh, uh, I want to uh, pass on a, uh, a thank you to Janet Brown, who many of you will know. Janet Brown is the, uh, uh, as, as advertised, and I think properly advertised, the best pollster in Alberta. And I've worked with Janet on a number of occasions in the past, including uh, she worked on a chapter for a book that brought out last year just for the election. You can still get copies of it, Anger and Angst, uh, The Kenny Legacy. Um, shameless plug. Uh, if you look here, uh, what you'll see is, in fact, the, the heavy blue line is support for the UCP. And the, uh, the lighter blue line is support either for Jason Kenney or Daniel Smith. And the interesting thing you'll see here is that pretty much throughout, and even after uh, Daniel Smith uh, is uh, becomes leader and, and premier, and this goes up to this past October, you'll see that Daniel Smith's popularity actually trails behind the UCP. So there's kind of a tradition of, you know, we, we like conservative parties, we don't even care about the leader, but we're going to vote for the party. And so a lot of people clearly had uh, misgivings about Jason Kenney, which is finally when the party uh, got rid of him. But even then, even despite the popularity of Danielle Smith, uh, she has trailed behind the party as a whole. So then look at this. Again, thank you to Janet Brown. And the uh, darker orange line here is uh, support for the NDP. But the lighter yellow line is uh, you know, support for uh, Rachel Notley. And you'll see that she, pretty much throughout, always eclipses support for the NDP. So this says a lot about the, the respect for uh, Rachel Notley that was held by a lot of people, is held by a lot of people uh, in, the, in the province. And uh, you'll, you'll note here, in fact, it, it eclipses for most of the time over 50%. So she, in surveys, pulled higher than her party. And this says a lot about, uh, in some sense, the difficulty the NDP has going forwards is because the next leader has to, again, surpass, in some sense, the popularity of the party uh, because our political system, to one extent or another, and whether this is good or bad, is, is indifferent. We are a very leader-driven uh, political 
um, uh, operation. Okay, so is there a pattern here? Uh, well, it's the economy, stupid, and I talked about uh, that before, about the, the price of oil. Uh, and so that, to a large extent, still very much drives our politics. And of course, we heard Daniel Smith last night talking about a pre-budget talk about what to do with money. It's really tight. We're going to put some in heritage fund, et cetera, et cetera. Persistence of conservatism. And I've said here, whatever that means, because having studied this for a long time now, I'm not even sure most people who say they're conservatives can tell me what being a conservative is in this province. It's populist, it's corporatist, it's big business, it's we like capitalism, we don't like capitalism, we just don't like those other guys, basically. Um, leadership matters. Uh, sometimes leadership matters even when it's really bad out there, uh, because sometimes you've got to find a way of just keeping the boat afloat until things turn around and people want to vote for you again. Enduring support in Edmonton, and I see absolutely no likelihood of this changing in the short term. Uh, the, the UCP would love to make inroads into uh, Edmonton. To some extent, it was actually kind of embarrassing that uh, they are the governing party and yet have no seats in the capital city. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one to, because the politics of Edmonton is very different than uh, in other parts. Occasional support in Calgary and here we see in Lethbridge. And so, of course, NDP had two seats, MLAs at one point, now we, we split them. But again, this shows the fact that, again, the, uh, the medium-sized cities are also not a total wasteland for the NDP. There is some support there. Uh, and again, there's support even in Calgary, which again, the politics of Calgary being a corporate oil city is very different from Edmonton. And yet, it's not totally opposed to the NDP particularly because of issues around uh, social issues and education, stuff like that. Um, in other parts of the province, I, as I showed you, about 32% of people actually vote for the NDP, uh, but it's support without seats. And again, because of our electoral system, it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, support uh, in practical sense. So. Here was a Leger poll, and this gets back to the influence of Notley. Uh, and in this poll, and remember, the polls between elections are kind of here, neither here nor there. Uh, one of the things the UCP has is they are governing. So they get lots of publicity every day, because every time they make an announcement, every time Smith talks, as last night, uh, they get publicity. And of course, she also gets a freebie because she has a radio show. Uh, that uh, no other uh, political leader in the province has. So uh, in that recent poll, UCP had 51%, NDP 40%. So, you know, give or take margins of error, it's, it still seems to be down a bit. Um, there is a, a growing gap. Uh, the battleground Calgary, which again, a few thousand votes one way or another actually would have the NDP would have won the election. You know, some of the ridings in Calgary were very, very close. 18% um, of respondents said that Notley leaving will help the party, compared to 24% have said it would hurt. 36% um, said it wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. And finally, 26% said a change in NDP leadership would make it very likely they'd vote for the party compared to 41% who indicated they would probably not support the NDP. So to some extent, this, this poll shows what we already knew, that uh, Notley is very uh, well liked uh, disproportionately by people compared with the party itself. So there's a potential loss here for the party depending on who becomes the leader and how they're able to frame themselves. So here we have the, uh, the contenders, uh, as is uh, uh, presently known. Three are known. And then we have a question mark. The question mark is not me, by the way. Uh, just, just so I, I want to get rid of any kind of rumors that might be floating around out there. Okay. So here are the, uh, the three, uh, the four possible people. Uh, there's Kathleen Ganley, 
who uh, our uh, local MLA, uh, Shannon Phillips, has come out in support of uh, Kathleen. Uh, a lawyer uh, has been uh, in the legislature since 2015, held the fairly prestigious Minister of Justice and Minister of Aboriginal Affairs roles. Uh, and one of the things that she has brought up so far is an increase to minimum wage. Of, all of these leaders so far, their, their platforms are fairly uh, meager, so we'll hear more over the next few months. Sarah Hoffman, uh, MLA Edmonton Glenora, has a teaching background, first elected 2015, also held a prestigious office, Minister of Health and Seniors in the Notley government and has said she will deal with the housing crisis. Obviously, that is a big issue, and particularly in, in Edmonton, but all over right now. Uh, and Rocky Pancholi, uh, a, uh, first elected in 2019, so uh, Rocky was not able to hold a position in the Notley government, uh, but again, a lawyer, uh, and has become quite prominent in the time since she was elected in 2019. And uh, very first, day out, a uh, shot out of the cannon, her first thing was she said she would end the consumer carbon tax, which was a uh, kind of, be, because it's a bold step, uh, many people immediately said, well, yeah, that's, that puts her on the map, like she's differentiated herself from the other candidates, and that's what you want to do in any kind of leadership race, uh, is and any kind of election, you want to look different from the people that you're competing with, and she did that on her first day out. Um, and then we have the question mark, question mark, question mark person uh, who is not elected, and I'll let you guess who this is, by the way. We'll hold a quiz at the end. Uh, a, a former Calgary mayor. It's interesting, actually, there's a kind of a history in Alberta, of course, of uh, people moving up from municipal politics being mayors in the main cities. Remember Lawrence Decor running against, against Ralph Klein was mayor of Edmonton, very prominent, and almost beat Ralph Klein. Ralph Klein, of course. And uh, so municipal politics can be a kind of a, uh, a breeding ground for people who move up to other areas. Um, <clears throat> very passionate, great speaker, has an incredibly high profile, and of all of the people who have announced and or have not announced, uh, certainly uh, this, uh, this individual, oh, okay, I'll let the cat out of the bag, Mayor Nenshi, uh, that, that Nenshi uh, has already, even the talk of it has brought a lot of kind of luster and excitement to the, uh, the idea. Um, all of the candidates have strengths. All of them have certain kinds of weaknesses. Um, one of the strengths for Ganley is she's from Calgary, and I think the party knows that they need to get into Calgary. They need to solidify the gains and they need to expand, but they also still need to move out of there. So picking someone because they're from Calgary may or may not necessarily work. Both Hoffman and Pancholi from Edmonton, again, this is a very strong base there, It'll be really interesting to see in the voting uh, how many members for the party actually come from Edmonton. Now, does that mean they vote for somebody from Edmonton, or will they look and say, okay, I understand, you know, this is someone from our area, but we need to also expand out of here. Will they take kind of that broader view? Um, in the case of uh, uh, Nahid Nenshi, um, very high profile, as I said, well-spoken, but has not been a member of the party. And so does this look like somebody that the party picks, were they to be the candidate and end up winning, that is kind of like we pick somebody because we think we can win with them because they have a high profile, as opposed to somebody who has really deep roots in, in the party. The other thing I will say is there's a big difference generally between municipal and provincial politics, just as there's a big difference between provincial politics and federal politics, which is why nobody who was ever premier has ever become prime minister, right? It's, it's a bridge too far to make that jump. There are different levels of politics. The final thing I'll say about uh, uh, Nahid Nenshi, and again, it's not to say that 
if he comes in, he may not be a very, very strong candidate. But some of the estimation that if he, uh, that he would be able to bring along Calgary, have to remember that by the time he was leaving, he was probably not as well liked as when he first became mayor in Calgary. And so there was, he might have been on the, the, the downhill slope there. And so if you think he's necessarily going to win Calgary, that may or may not be the case. But the, the members will have to decide among all these people, and who knows, maybe even someone else will step into it. Although, again, it's not me. <laughs> OK. So some issues that the NDP, doesn't matter who comes, uh, takes over, is going to have to overcome. First, that idea that they're tied to big labor, to the liberals, to the federal NDP, all of which is totally silly and bogus, but if you're an opponent, you fly with it. One, there is no big labor in Alberta. This is not Ontario, and it's not Quebec, and it's not British Columbia. <laughs> the labor unions in this province are, yes, constrained largely to Edmonton, but they're very small. Uh, they have influence, but they're not going to move this ship all over the place. They're not tied to the Liberals. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, at times, even in the Not Notley years, they had some dust-ups between them. And uh, although structurally they're tied to the NDP, you see again that they have all kinds of arguments between themselves about issues because that makes perfect sense. Uh, you, you wouldn't find provincial conservatives necessarily always agreeing with federal conservatives as well, which is going to be a really interesting thing for Polyev to have to deal with if he becomes prime minister and has to deal with Daniel Smith. <laughs> Perception number two, or two, that they're poor economic managers. Now, this is a really interesting one, because if you think of the ins and outs, the twos and fro's, the, the uh, you know, ups and downs of the Alberta economy, which has been dominated by conservative parties of, under various names for years, have they done a wonderful job <laughs> with, with uh, the economy? A lot of people would say, well, no, they don't seem to do a very good job. I think we'll just change to another conservative party and hope they, they do a better job. Um, so the NDP, as I said, who knows how they would have done had they had $75, $80 a barrel oil coming in. But the fact is they had $18 a barrel oil. <laughs> so you know, it's a bit of a, a stretch to, to say necessarily they're bad economic managers. We can also find some provinces where NDP has, in fact, done a reasonably decent job over the years. Anti-oil. There are some supporters of the NDP who would like to see the NDP be a lot tougher with the oil industry. And I think in some ways they probably could have, but there are practical politics here. But there's nothing particularly to say in the NDP that they are anti-oil. After all, oil still is an important commodity here. Breaking out of the Edmonton bubble, I've already said that I think one of the things for the NDP they need to do is find a way to, um, to solidify gains in Calgary, but most importantly, get into the rest of the province, uh, which is misnamed as being rural because it really isn't any longer. Uh, but they need to get out practically and in the perception that they are just simply an Edmonton-based party. And finally, uh, gaining a platform while you're in opposition. This is one of the hardest things that uh, parties in opposition always faced. And it may have something to do with that poll we saw about the, the, the growing gap between the NDP and the UCP to some extent. And that is the UCP seems to be on, in the news all the time. What does the NDP bring to the, the table? The one thing that will keep them in the news, of course, potentially, is the leadership race. That actually, they hope, will generate a certain amount of excitement that will last over a few months and who knows uh, in the period afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so a few things the next NDP leader has to be. Smart and articulate. You're going to have to be able to really communicate extremely well because you're going against Daniel Smith, who for all her faults 
is a, uh, a very good communicator. She sounds plausible and like she knows what she's talking about even when she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, she even convinces herself that she knows what she's talking about. Um, you have to be able to talk policy, at least understand it well enough that, that you have, you know, there's some clue where you want to go, but you can't sound like a policy wonk. You can't sound like all you do all day is think about wonderful plans out there, you know, sitting in your room wearing your pajama pants and your t-shirt. Uh, you have to be really fast on your feet and adept with media. And again, this gets back to Daniel Smith, who uh, her one real talent is that she was trained in the media. And, and increasingly, we see a lot of politicians, that's what they are. There may not be anything else there, but they know how to handle the media. You have to be able to organize and hold the team together. This can be really important, uh, although I think the NDP will, whatever wounds come out of the leadership race, will pull together afterwards, but you've got to be the leader. You've got to organize them with a mission. You also have to be friendly and warm and able to connect with ordinary Albertans. That is, uh, you have to seem as uh, some people say, like somebody who that the, the average person would want to sit down and have a beer with or at least a cup of coffee, right? And politicians who can't do that usually end up losing really quickly, right? You have to be able to speak to regular folk. And finally here I'd say, uh, suggest you have to be principled, and that is you can't be so wishy-washy that you're all over the map. But uh, you also, while still adhering to certain principles that we know what you stand for, you also have to be flexible enough, and if you make a mistake, this is something politicians, the best ones, have learned, is to say, oh, I made a mistake, and I'm going to back off that. And that was one talent that Ralph Klein actually did have. Uh, Ralph Klein didn't have a lot of principles, but he knew when he made a mistake, he was going to back out of it. <laughs> Um, the last thing I will say here, uh, just very quickly before uh, going to the, the thanks slide there, is um, that one of the first things they, whoever is picked as leader is going to have to do really quickly out of the gate is, and the party's going to have to do this with them, is define them. Because one of the things that all modern politics is about is trying to define who that person is. And the opposition will very quickly move to put whoever is picked as leader in a box that uh, for the public, and, and this is who that person is, right? And so to counter that, you have to be really adept and very quick at getting out there and saying, this is who this person is, this is why you should vote for them. They're credible, they're smart, they're friendly, they're a wonderful person, they'd be a great premier. And you've got to get out there and do that framing because two, two and a half years is going to go by, the next election's on, but that initial framing is what's going to stay even two years hence. So, thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you. It's just an aside, really, but you know, you know, the previous slide with the three candidates and the mystery candidate. I think the reason uh, Trevor didn't put the name down for the fourth candidate was he couldn't figure out how to spell it. <laughs> um, a little bit of housekeeping stuff here before we go to Q and A. SACPA memberships are available uh, today and every Thursday, and you can speak to me actually after the uh, end of the uh, the end of the session if you want to. Um, to uh, renew your membership. Thanks to LSCO who give us this space for free and in return we uh, patronize their cafeteria and it's good food. Uh, we welcome suggestions, speaking on the behalf of the SACPA board, we welcome suggestions about future topics. By all means, if you have an idea percolating, uh, talk to us, uh, one of the board. And there's SACPA jars on the table that uh, encourage you to pop a toonie in that helps us uh, do some of the things we do. So thank you for your support. Okay, let's get to Q&A and, and we'll uh, ask people as usual to line up along this side here and, and give your name and a uh, short question and, and uh, we'll get the responses. So 
Uh, we look forward to some people lining up. Here comes somebody. Hi, I don't have to give my name. He already said it. Somebody. Oh, I'm Henning Mundel. <laughs> he said, here comes somebody. <laughs> um, I know that too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a question for you, Trevor. With the um, dominance of Rachel over many years within the NDP, um, in a certain way, I guess one has to look at whoever follows will be sort of following in her footsteps or in her shadow. With Rachel uh, uh, saying that she plans to assist the transition and actually to keep uh, stay in the legislature, what do you think will be the pros and cons of that for a future leader? That, that's a, uh, a really good question. Um, It'll be interesting to see how long she actually stays on. I, I certainly wouldn't expect her to run in the next election in 2027, presumably. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, actually, about Rachel Notley, and, and a really big plus here, obviously, is that she was the daughter uh, of, uh, of her, her father was one of the most respected politicians ever in Alberta. And had he not actually uh, died, I think, Grant many people have said could have raised the NDP up and maybe he could have become uh, premier. Uh, so that was really important, uh, that name recognition. On the other hand, Rachel Notley, when she was first elected as an MLA, uh, outside of, again, a circle of people and in Edmonton, wouldn't have been all that well known in the rest of the province, right? So there was a kind of growth there where she was able to define herself and rise up to make herself an important key part of the party. And so that will be the test for the next person. Yes, it's going to be because of the status that Rachel Notley has, that's going to be something the next leader has to, uh, I wouldn't say fight against, but be aware of. But it's not insurmountable again. Uh, it is possible, but it's always one of those things when you have a particularly beloved leader for the next person coming along, how do they kind of compare, right? So it's a good question, and we'll see how it plays out. <clears throat> Hi, Trevor. Thanks uh, for your talk. I'm Tony Pargeter. Uh, I'd like your thoughts on the oil industry and how a future leader could approach that whole issue. I understand the need to not seem too anti-oil uh, in hopes of getting elected, that being the basis of the economy, but I th think in the last elections an opportunity has been lost to push for, you know, to emphasize the NDP's role in the transition. Um, you didn't even mention uh, boosting renewables in your list of accomplishments, and I thought that was a biggie, and, you know. Um, it got lost. They didn't want to talk about it because they didn't want to be anti-oil. And I fear, hearing candidate statements, that they're going overboard in the other direction. We hate the carbon tax. Got to get rid of the carbon tax. We, we, we love uh, hydrogen. The oil industry's got it handled. Yeah, this is the oil industry's line, and uh, it seems candidates are lining up with the industry. We're going to turn all that carbon into buckyballs or bitumen pucks or something, and everything's going to be good. We just keep on going. Is there a scope for a thrust in the other direction to really push the transition and, uh, and, and uh, you know, boost renewables and seize, you know, push the opportunities involved rather than, you know, pretending the oil industry can just carry on? Mm -hmm. Re really good question again. Uh, the, and I should say here, one of, the, one of the dangers and problems for the NDP is in a basically a two, now two-party province, it was always a one-party province forever, is that uh, there are people on the, the classical NDP side, the left, who want uh, to, to push even harder for a certain kind of social democratic party, uh, policies. There are also people who more towards the moderate center 
say, well, no, we can't do that. And so electability is always a big question with parties. Are you a party of ideology or are you a party that actually wants to win and govern? That, that's a, something that all parties have to fight with. And I think there is a concern among some uh, traditional NDP supporters that the party is going to turn itself into some kind of variation of uh, just a liberal party, right? And that, that is a real danger. To the extent that it's not able people within the party to square those those differences uh, you know it's always possible you could lose a lot of people along the way right they're going to say well why this is not the NDP that I voted for in terms of the the past election and going in now to this leadership race uh, I do think that uh, certainly the party has downplayed a lot of its uh, legitimate opposition or at least future vision of what the province should look like post oil uh, and I think during the election I'll, I'll say right out I think the NDP actually ran a really bad election uh, I think the election was there to be had and they didn't run a good election and some of it was they didn't put forward a vision of what Alberta should look like post oil the the transition is going to happen and even the oil companies understand it's going to happen. And it's very curious that the two political parties are not actually talking about that in a kind of meaningful way with Albertans about, you know, this is what, but it could be exciting, right? I mean, Albertans do want a clean environment. They are concerned about global warming and they do see that the writing's on the wall and it's amazing to me that we have a lot of politicians who don't want to get out there and actually talk about these things. But they're, they're risk averse. And that's what a lot of politicians are, unfortunately. So hope to answer your very good question. But. Hi, Trevor. Ken Sears. Um, actually, a, a, an observation and then a question. We've, we're talking really in the moderate to short term to the next election, three years. Um, but, okay, but looking backwards, just even to this last election, one thing I noticed in rural Alberta, and it's, this is very much a personal observations, is it is no longer seen as dangerous to your health in small town Alberta to be, a, to self-identify as a member of the NDP. However, that's still 30% of the population. And that, at the moment, rural Alberta holds the balance of power politically in this province. They just have that many, just enough seats, just enough seats. Mm -hmm. But, and this is the question, given the demographic change in this province, the number of new immigrants coming in, most of whom, the vast majority of whom, will be settling in Edmonton, Calgary, and the medium-sized cities like Lethbridge, they will come into a political situation where their political surroundings make it not impossible to think about joining the NDP or supporting the NDP. Now, okay, I'm trying to do this fast. I had to, I had to lay the, the groundwork here. <coughs> the, given that, and those, the, the next revamping uh, of the electoral system in this province, do you foresee that that will make a significant change in Alberta politics? Again, one of the nice things about coming to SACPA, you always do get really good questions. A uh, couple of things there, uh, it's right, there are a lot of people. We know that Alberta, once again, is a magnet for people coming here. Uh, irrespective of the fact that, you know, housing is still a real problem, but the, the idea that you're going to make tons and tons of money. Um, so there's two things. One, as all those people come in, so the demographics change and the, uh, the electoral boundaries uh, have to change too. There, it's actually mandated. There's a certain leeway there. But, uh, and over the years, the, the writings have been jerry-rigged in a way that have favored conservative parties, in this case now the UCP. Uh, but th they will have to actually make those changes, you know, and at some point in the next number of years. I'm not sure if they'll have to do it before the next election, though. But the other thing is, of course, all of those people who are coming in need to be mobilized to actually, one, they have 
to be mobilized in the sense, do you see that I have interests here and do I want to vote? That's, that's one issue. The second thing is they actually have to be mobilized to see that their interests coincide with a particular party. So there is a possibility there for the NDP perhaps to uh, get these people to vote for them. There's equally a chance that the UCP or another party could say, well, we can mobilize these people to vote for us. So that's kind of up in the air. And the other thing is, is of course, are these people who are going to see that their interests are served being involved in the political system at all? The other group that, of course, we should keep in mind here is young people. Uh, and young people don't tend to vote very well at all uh, in elections. And so if you're going to go out and think about where is a crop of uh, potential voters that I want to harvest, you might want to start thinking about young people who uh, to some extent may just view politicians as, ah, they're all the same and what's in it for me. So, But in terms of the sheer demographics, you're absolutely right, there is going to be that's going to push change in this province. We just don't know which direction it's going to take. Hi, Leona Jacobs. I have many things going on in my head, but um, the other night I listened to, I discovered a podcast called Alberta Unbound, and it's run by Senator Paula Simons. And this particular, there's three seasons, and I listened to season one, and it was a less than two hours in duration uh, panel that was held on March 5th, 2020, which included two conservatives, one MP, one MLA, former MLA, um, a journalist, and Jared Wesley from the University of Alberta. And it was so interesting to me because Jared Wesley had anyone listening do a mental exercise in terms of when you close your eyes and think of the typical Albertan, and pretty much, including myself, surprisingly, um, th thought about yeah yeah okay, thought about the 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 typical Albertan as being you know the cowboy, basically, and he he pushed back. So to what extent do the perceptions we hold of ourselves and of each other influence what's going to transpire? In both election-wise and perhaps in leadership-wise. And already, the head of the TBA has come out slamming Sarah Hoffman for her body image. So um, will that actually work for her or against her in terms of, of uh, her thing? Because she's come out and said, I'm fat, I'm sassy, and I'm an unapologetic NDP. So. Uh, thank you, uh, thanks, Leona. Um, just on the last point, that. That's very spunky, that's, that's a good response. Um, I, I think we would be silly to think that uh, image is not, including physical image, is not an important thing in terms of why people vote for people. But, um, but that sounds like a, a wonderful response and uh, Sarah's you know, very credible candidate. She's held a, a good office, she's very smart and uh, yeah. Um, in terms of the, uh, the image of Alberta as a whole I think that's absolutely true. There is kind of a, a outside of the province, and we understand that. There's a lot of people who perceive Alberta as still, yeah, lots of cowboys running around. It's wilderness, and you go out hunting and fishing and everything. Um, that hasn't been true for probably 25, 30 years. It's it's a, it's it's a weird kind of image, and and in fact, people don't know this, but it's some time now that Alberta is the most urbanized province in the country. Uh, you just take a drive between Edmonton and Calgary. Well, take a drive from here to Calgary and keep on going. It's just one big strip of urban developments. Um, so those rural images have disappeared. But your point that a lot of Albertans still hold that, and whether or not they hold it as an image of who we are as opposed to who we would like to be. We would like to go back to a simpler time where, you know, we just went out there and, you know, could go hunting and fishing and, you know, the water was clean, et cetera, et cetera. Images like that are really powerful things and politicians play with them all the time in order to get votes. And to some extent they stick. 
But uh, any successful or credible or meaningful politician, I think, in this province and elsewhere needs to start to poke holes in those things. I'm a great believer in truth and actually and reality. And, and it's about time politicians actually started to, to make people have to look at what the reality is of the world around them. And, and if, but I'm a utopian, so. <laughs> Uh, Trevor Page, uh, leading on from what you've just said, Trevor, uh, the World Economic Forum, which just concluded, um, found that, or is predicting, that AI, uh, misinformation and fake information are the biggest issues we face globally. Do you have any thoughts on how that might affect our elections? Well, do you have about two hours? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I think it is, a, it is a real threat. I wonder to, to some extent is it a being manufactured more of a threat than it is. I, I'm not enough of an expert on it to really say. Uh, I, uh, I yeah, I really can't add an awful lot to uh, the, the real concerns about it. That you pick up a newspaper, well, if, you, if we had newspapers, uh, if you go uh, looking on the, the internet right now, you'll find all kinds of stuff out there uh, about uh, Britney Spears being uh, inhabited by AI. I don't know, so yeah, I can't add to it, sorry. <laughs> I think I can squeeze in a question of my own, Trevor. I'd like to put you on the spot. Um, I'm not asking about your personal opinion, your bias, but if you were an advisor to the provincial NDP uh, leading up to the leadership convention, would you advise uh, choosing a f that fourth candidate with, it, with his uh, assets and drawbacks? Hmm. I, I wouldn't advise one way or another. I would just simply uh, say that you you need to sort of strike a, a committee and have a a fairly widespread discussion with a lot of different people about it, those pros and cons, some of which I've laid out. There's undoubtedly other ones. And that you need to think seriously about uh, whether or not you would accept that person as your, your candidate, given all of those different possibilities there yeah um, yeah you're right <laughs> that's very astute he caught that I wasn't answering the question <laughs> wonderful presentation thank you uh, Bev trainer speaking uh, considering the um, comment made previously about the younger generation. I just read this morning that millennials now outnumber the baby boomers. And when you're talking about young people and how they think, <clears throat> and a lot of our younger people coming in are from immigrant families, families coming in, do you see the possibility of a third party in Alberta that might accommodate these people? And, and I'm, I have my thoughts on that <clears throat> because a lot of them, my impression is, my opinion is, that they lean very much towards, in the States, it's called the Republican Party. I, I whisper that. But, <laughs> but you, you follow what I'm attempting to say. Where are their views and where's their thinking and do you see a third party here? Because I don't see either party accommodating them very well. So uh, I just want to know how how is it those millennials snuck up on me and everything? What what happened here that suddenly I've been surpassed? I, 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 it happened while I was sleeping, I think. Um, 
I don't know where all the, the new people moving in, and some are immigrants, obviously, from outside Canada. When we think about coming people migrating in here, a lot of them are, could be from Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, or whatever. Uh, so it comes down to what are their particular values and beliefs. Uh, can they again be attracted into either of the two parties? I don't know, uh, and and some may not choose to be attracted to any party, partly because they may have no sense of setting down roots here. Remember, a lot of people over the years have come here for, uh, you know, to make some money, uh, you know, for a good time, but not a long time, and then they disappear again. They go to BC or they go back wherever they came from. So recruiting people like that to uh, your party is, is not always easy. Um, so I'd, the chances of a third party, there's always talk about getting a third party off the ground here, but the fact that there's a, a floating contingent of people who may or may not be, not be attracted to some new party takes a lot more than that to get a party off the ground. You need money, you need some kind of organization, you need some dynamic leader who's going to say, hey, don't vote for those guys, I'm the real thing. It has happened before, you know, William Aberhart, Peter Lougheed basically created the Conservative Party out of virtually nothing. But it's not something that just happens overnight. And uh, although there might be a lot of interest out there, right now I don't see the, the structural necessities to actually get that off the ground. I think we're pretty much stuck with, with two parties to whatever, uh, whether you like that or not. Leona Jacobs. So I get to follow up with my um, other issue that's happening in my head. Um, so so the, the, uh, in the same podcast, the observation was made that in 2015, um, Rachel Notley and the NDP presented an alternative that people swarmed to and um, overcame the hubris of the PCs under Prentice at the time. Um, so, and then the observation was made that in 2019, they fell off that track. It was a very, in 2015, it was a very pragmatic, you know, here we are, here's who we stand for. It was very transparent. Um, but in 2015, then they started to play that game of trying to hold power. And in, as you have pointed out, 2023 was just a bad campaign, in my opinion, too. So to what extent is it about the back room? Because in 2015, the campaign manager for the NDP was Brian Topp, if I'm recalling correctly. And it was a very steady as she goes, straightforward, no holds barred campaign. But in 2019 and 2023, the whole thing has turned into a bit of a sport. Mm -hmm. And we lost the messaging in all of the rabble that was going on. So what about the back room? What, what's going on in the back room? Because I, I really have a belief that the, the people in the back room are now gamers as adults. Like the gamers have, have matured into adulthood and now they're finding new games to play. And so to what extent does that influence either the leadership campaign, because they're feeding into that too, and the election itself? Uh, again, really good question. Uh, I too have heard actually that uh, some people have said, and after you lose an election, everybody's always out looking for who to blame for it. So there's a lot of talk that the people in the back rooms, the, the handlers overhandled or just made some mistakes there. And there is some uh, debate going on, I think, within the party about how much influence, and also how do you spread the influence? How do you bring new voices in is, I think, an important question. I would say, actually, in 2015, why the NDP actually won is, one, uh, Notley's credibility, the, uh, the perceived incompetence of the uh, Conservatives, and, and let's remember, most of the time, people vote against something, they don't vote for it. So they were voting against, they are tired of the Conservatives. And really what the NDP offered, irrespective of any particular policy regimes they had, they ran on a policy of, we'll be competent, <laughs> right? 
that, and we should never forget that just saying you're competent wins a lot of votes from people. And, and you know, we'll be competent, we'll be honest, and credit to the NDP, during that four years they were in office, there was never one major scandal. Every other government I can think of going back a few decades has been racked with all kinds of shenanigans. 2019, again, as I said, I think the oil, the price of oil, I just think th there was no way to win that election, okay? Uh, and given the massive attacks from the almost chock-a-block right-wing media in the province, I, I just think there was absolutely no way to win that. Uh, this time around, I think that their biggest mistake was relying on attacking Daniel Smith. I think everybody already knew that Daniel Smith says outrageous, stupid, indefensible kinds of things. Everybody knew who she was. I think the NDP just didn't do a very good job of saying what they would do that would be different. And had they actually made a sales pitch saying, here's how government will look different under us, those few thousand votes that they needed probably would have been swung. The other thing is I have to say actually is the NDP going into the last election um, had done a lot of work beforehand in recruiting high profile candidates, especially in Calgary. They had some really named people. Again, the old issue, are you NDP or are you really liberal? They had a lot of people there though who were perceived as great, being credible candidates and it amazed me throughout the election that they never talked about the team, the team of people that were going to actually be coming into office. If you elect these people, you know, we've got this team ready to go. Frankly, the candidates just on paper that the NDP had going into the last election, if you just simply went by credentials, the NDP hands down had a better team than did the UCP, right? Right across the board, they were the Winnipeg Blue Bombers versus the Edmonton Elks, right? They just would have killed them, but they didn't talk about it. It was all about Daniel Smith, Daniel Smith, Daniel Smith. And by the way, you like Rachel Notley. Well, that wasn't enough to sway votes, and, and it was a shame. It was an opportunity lost uh, for the NDP. Trevor, we're about to close, and uh, you get the last word. Uh, you, do you have any uh, summary message or uh, comment you want to make that, or, or the question that nobody asked that you'd like to answer? <laughs> uh, brevity, no. Uh, once, once again, uh, thank you. Keep up the wonderful work. You're a, an incredible organization. You're quite unique throughout the province, as I think you uh, know yourselves. So keep up the good work. I'll be happy to come back at uh, other, some other time in future. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the uh, winter, such as it is.